Okay, let's run. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes to join us from many and all corners of the universe and we find out more about them by taking your questions i am your host ryan of and i quote and we're going to be starting something new here on this channel known as the quote of the month and the quote for this month of december 2023 just happens to be you're so money you don't even know it there you go so on this episode of and i quote we have urban fantasy writer and apparently she's not your average everyday bookworm. No, 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 no. She is what is known as a book dragon from Dragon World. Please welcome Serby Gray to the stage. Serby Gray, great to see you. How are you, my friend? Hey, thanks for having me. Well, we're very thankful to have you here with us. Now, if you have any questions for Serby Gray as we go throughout the course of this episode, by all means, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Our producer is going to be keeping an eye on it as we go throughout the course of this show. And also, if this is your first time here, welcome. And don't forget to like and share this with all of your closest friends. Without any further ado, Serby, what, were, what would you say were some of your favorite books or writers growing up? Oh, gosh. Um, there's so many. But I would say definitely Anne McCaffrey, um, Robin McKinley. Um, I had an unhealthy love for Pierce Anthony, which I'm afraid has messed up my humor because now I find puns everywhere. So maybe if I could have erased some of that, I would have dialed it down um, during my formative years. Um, but I really loved reading everything I could get my hands on. I loved going to the local library and just like taking a book stack like this with my library card. Um, that was freedom for me because it was a way to escape and go into any other type of world. Sounds simply so magical. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if anyone caught that, more power to you, because I grew up watching that particular property a number of times as a young and and still today as an adult, or does anyone really grow up? We're all young at heart. Let's just face the facts. <laughs> but, speaking, but speaking of which, what would you say are some of your if you have any favorite movies or TV series, past or present, anything stand out to you? Okay, so that's a little complicated. Um, since I was an English major and now I'm an English teacher, you know, there's there's things I admire and then there's things I actually like. And sometimes they come together, right? So Breaking Bad, oh my gosh, it was so well written. It was so well crafted. I would not watch it again. I would not experience that a second time. So I can enjoy that ride. It was harrowing, right? Like my heart beat fast in many, many scenes. I was so upset for like what happened to different characters. So I admire it. I don't know, but I just, I can't go through that again. Um, as opposed to more like cozy reads, um, like The Hero and the Crown by Robin McKinley or Sunshine by Robin McKinley. Those are like my comfort reads. Um, and then, well, you said you said TV, so movies. The Kiera Knightley, um, her her Pirates of the Caribbean, her Pride and Prejudice, like I could watch those almost any time, and like just have the feelings again. I don't even have to watch the entire movie, like that. Those are things I could just come in halfway through and just feel good watching. It just very good, very interesting tiles there. And speaking of Kira Knightley, I actually just sat down and watched this for the first time, one of her uh, more later performances of her career, respectively. And by the way, she doesn't seem to age; she's still young. Uh, Kira Knightley was in a movie called The Nutcracker in the Four Realms. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I have not seen that. I would like to. That's kind of on my 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 radar for this holiday season. Okay, well that's fair. It and, and I actually liked it. It's an interesting take on the classic story of what is known as the Nutcracker, and she happens to play a character by the name of. I believe it's Sugar Plum. 
So she's kind of this happy-go-lucky, you know, spunky, you know, hey, hey, kind of character. And she went, she went all out for this character. I'm not even kidding you. This is completely different than anything I've seen her in respect to. And yes, I've seen her in Pride and Prejudice. Yes, I grew up watching a little indie film called Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> of the Black Pearl. Uh, which is one of the greatest action-adventure movies of all time, by the way. That's one of the best of all time. The sequels, not so much. Uh, that they, they were diminishing returns for me on a personal and professional level, but Hey, that's neither here nor there. So if you get a chance, please feel free to sit down and watch the Nutcracker in the four realms starring Kira Knightley. She's actually the top billing in that movie. So. All right. Yeah. Well now I definitely have to do it. Yeah. Feel free to uh, watch that stream it, enjoy it. And it's the holiday season. So why, why not? And when did you decide to become a writer yourself? Oh, I mean, gosh. Um, I think that's one of those questions where, you know, you look back and you're like, it kind of was always what I did, right? So when I read, I would always either imagine myself as one of the characters, you know, who do I identify with? Or if there wasn't one I identified with, I'd be like, mm, let me insert a character here who gets to have, you know, the big part or the fun part. And so I was already kind of doing that in my imagination is trying to put myself into those worlds. And if I was a character, what would I do in those worlds? And that, of course, is, is early world building, right? It's early characterization and looking for um, what's the motivation for how that works in that scene. And I was already trying to be a part of that. Okay. I see. I see. And what would you say are some of the biggest rewards about being a writer? Okay. Um <sighs> For me, the reward is when I connect with readers who like what I wrote. When I put myself into a story and then they're like, oh my gosh, this scene made me cry. I'm sorry, that makes me happy. That makes me happy that I got that emotional response from you because you were invested in my world and my characters. Is that horrible and selfish? Maybe. No, I, I mean... I wouldn't say I wouldn't necessarily say that, but then again, it's a you know someone else may have their own feelings about it, and that's fine. To each their own, as they say, uh, for sure. But thank you for sharing that with us. On the flip side of the coin, though, what are some of the biggest challenges about being a writer? Yeah, um, well, the opposite is when you are putting yourself into a story, and then you launch it into the world, and nothing happens, right? You're not hitting the right audience. You're not getting that response. You're not getting that, that connection because like all humans want connection, right? And the way we get it is through telling stories, whether it's the stories about ourself, which is our friendships, right? Where we're constantly meeting other people and saying, this is my story. This is who I am. And they're telling us, oh, well, this is my story. And the friendship is when you say, that's cool. I'm interested in your story. Let's go together for a little while, right? And so I'd say the hardest part of being a writer is when you have to stay um, in your room writing a story that at that point only you believe in, right? And just hoping, okay, well, I hope by the time I have a cover on this and by the time it's been editing and by the time this comes together, that it's going to be something that connects with other people. Because if it doesn't, then everything I'm doing is for nothing. Well said. Well said. What are pieces of advice would you give to aspiring writers out there? Oh, wow. Uh, get a real job. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm tell us kidding. That, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I guess to aspiring writers, I would say, and I don't follow this advice myself. So let me, let me, you know, but I would say, um, don't be scared to be vulnerable. It's going to hurt. If your story doesn't hurt or affect you when you're telling it, it's not going to affect others. And so um, for my first book in my Misbegotten series, it's called Flames of a Falling God. I basically was sharing a story that I told to my son when my daughter ha was diagnosed with leukemia. It was a very personal story. Um, and I was like, what are... What are people going to think? But at the same time, I almost didn't care because I had written it for my son. So I almost had a buffer in terms of, you know what? This story already served its purpose by helping my family get through a very difficult time. 
But when I published the next book, that's when I had the, oh my gosh, I've created this from nothing except my imagination. I've created this book only from my own feelings and my own take on what is happening in my world. So that's when I had that pressure, that second book, because that wasn't quite so rooted in something that had already served a purpose. I see. I see. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with us. Do greatly appreciate it. And once again, we are here with urban fantasy author Serby Gray on And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this with everyone you know. If you have any questions for her, by all means, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. We're more than happy to take those as they come in respectively. And we thank you for being with us, whether it's your first time here or whether you've been with us since the beginning of time. Or should I say the beginning of this channel? I'm sorry. My words are a bit twisty today, but hey, things happen. So we thank you for sharing those. Now, I do want to share something with you here. And you mentioned this just a moment ago, but what? how did this all come about? And as the executives would say, what's the elevator pitch? Okay. Um, the elevator pitch is um, American Gods meets the road, except it's Mesopotamian Gods burning down Baltimore. Boy, that's an interesting. <laughs> that's an interesting way of presenting the story. Yes, and how and how did this all come about? Um, okay, so I guess at this point in my life, I had kind of set writing aside. I had tried to kind of go in the literary fiction um, because I'd already gotten my master's, and I was like, okay, you know, I should be writing stories, you know, more towards the New Yorker or towards things that are going to enhance that career. Um, and it wasn't working and it was very frustrating and I wasn't finding any joy there. So I'd kind of set aside writing and I um, moved into having a family. And um, I had two and a half year old twins, identical twins. And um, one of them was diagnosed with leukemia. And so um, I was down at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. And it was all, it was all, it was so fast. Like it just happened. So it was like one day, everything was fine. And then the next day, every, nothing was fine. So um, the twins had never been separated in their lives. Like their cribs were right next to each other. I was separated from my other children. At that time I had, um, my son was six, my daughter was eight. And then I had the two and a half year old twins. And, um, and so we're at the hospital and she suddenly has this life-threatening disease and um it was 2012 and everyone was talking about you know the mayan long count how the world was going to end at the end and um you know as i'm sitting in this room looking out over baltimore um, i was thinking what would happen if the world ended and you were a mom and your child had a life-threatening disease like what would you do and um, it was just kind of in the back of my mind. And um, I had started writing again just uh, on Caring Bridge, which is how you, when people want to know what's going on with your child, you're able to like just write in one place and then they can catch up. Um, and so I'd started writing again, but just a very factual kind of, this is what's happening. And then it almost turned into literally like a diary. Like it was, it was a way for me to take what I was feeling and put it out there and just having people write little notes like, hey, I'm reading this today or hey, um, hang in there. It was giving me that support that I needed. But um, while this was also going on, um, my son's first grade teacher called me and she said, I hate to bother you. I know that you are at Hopkins because my daughter and I stayed in that room. Gosh, I'm going to misremember. I think it, it was either 37 or 41 days straight. I can't remember now, but like we lived in that room. And um, so she called me and she's like, I hate to bother you. I know what's going on with your family, but I need you to know that your son um, in, in his journal today, they draw a picture and then they do stretch spelling. And he said, I wish I had leukemia. So my mom would spend time with me. Right. Yeah. So I immediately thanked her. Teachers are wonderful, giving people. I knew that she really had thought about whether to tell me this, but it was the right thing to do. And um, and so I realized how much, you know, this was disrupting not just my life. It was not just me about like getting through this and trying to get my daughter who had the illness through this, but about getting my other children through this as well. And so I called my son 
And what I did then is I said, what if um, this was about you and me? So that, cause he felt left out. Right. And so that was like, it all kind of started to come together in my imagination where it was myself and my son in a world where ancient gods had returned because, you know, that's what ancient gods do. And so every time I saw him, whatever we did together, I turned into fantasy. So when we went down to Assateague Island, um, we saw horseshoe crabs. So in my book, they became zombie horseshoe crabs. And it had to be about how he and I negotiated getting past the zombie horseshoe crabs. Um, and whenever he did something like, um, you know, mom, I want this or that, or this happened, we put it into the book. And so it became this like journal of adventures where he now felt included and not discluded because I was with my other child who needs my attention at the time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's, this is heavy, uh, but Sorry. also, no, it's okay. Not only is this heavy, but also it, 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 ma it makes a lot of sense. It's important. And yeah. I, hmm, wow. Siblings feeling left out. Like I wish I had a, Terminal disease and my mom spent time. My gosh, I cannot begin to imagine how difficult and challenging that must have been for all parties involved, not just the individual who was diagnosed with this, but my goodness. I mean, I agree. This is a time where family has to lean on each other the most and come together as one cohesive unit because that's when you're strongest, is when you come together as one. So, God. But yeah, it's yeah. It, and Assateague Island. I've been there myself as a former Marylander. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with Assateague Island. Too many bugs flying around. Gosh, <laughs> it's it's just mm, you know you got the ponies and stuff, but at the same, it's just it, it, you need like a, a shield ray to get away from the bugs and mosquitoes <laughs> are around there, my friend. It, it, it's not an easy place to be at. I got to be honest. I went there maybe once or twice, and I said to my family afterwards, I said, you know what? I don't know if I want to come back here. This That's is a fair. little too. It's a little yeah. too too much too much of this. I just want to relax, you know. I want, enjoy, <laughs> I want to enjoy myself wherever I am, but at the same time, this is this is you need like a giant bottle of raid. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? If you if you've been to Assateague Island, if you have experiences like I've had, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat if you're. <laughs> but as far as the horseshoe crabs are concerned, I had no problem with them. It's the oh no, they're really horseshoe crabs are like. Fantastic. Yeah, but correct me if I'm wrong. Are those the ones where you can buy those at Sensations if you're in Ocean City somewhere? Like you can get your own crab? Those are hermit crabs. Hermit crab. Oh, gosh. See, I get the two H's confused. See, this is my problem. It's horseshoe or the hermit crabs. You can't have it both ways, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but yes, <laughs> you can buy hermit crabs from what is known as Sensations, a.k.a. the touristy store. Does anyone remember? <laughs> and by the way, they're still around. I just want to let you know that for the record. Have you been to those before? Oh, yeah. You've been to, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Oh, right? yeah, and you've got the taffy store, and you've got the dough roller where you candy get the kitchen. pizza and the pancakes. It's called yeah. Candy Kitchen for the yes. saltwater taffy. Candy Kitchen, remember that? Yeah, dough roller, you're absolutely right. <laughs> that's another That's another one, which you can find. How many locations are there now? Like five, oh, six, like, seven, eight, or ten? I know, you go every couple blocks, and there's a new one. Is that is that right? Okay, maybe so. they put in more since I've been away. I haven't been to OCMD uh, <laughs> for bits, which everyone says that there, and I didn't know this until I did a little bit of what is known as research uh, a little bit later on. There's more than one ocean city in this country. And that's the kind of thing that throws me off because to me, there's only, there, it's like Highlander. There can well, be only one. Yeah, but Ocean City, New Jersey, they have their own rules. Like you've got to buy the tags to go on the beach. They've got the lifeguards who like blow whistles at you. They have a lot of rules. Really? In Ocean City, New Jersey. Really? Mm -hmm. I was not aware of this. I haven't been to this area before. So yeah. anyone else would know probably more than me. You have to get licenses and tech. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> that is just, what do we call that? That's, uh, that's hogwash. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not something we want to uh, particularly, but OCMD, in the words of Highlander, there can be only one. I'm sorry. I went there every summer as a kid i can't help it i got a soft spot for that area you know what i mean it's just, yeah it's a thing you know when you're a kid you fly kites when you're a kid you play with the toys on the beach when you're a kid on the beach you're making what sand castles yes right yeah and you're designing stuff while you're on the beach maybe you're playing with a shovel you, you gotta you know? dig a hole you gotta dig a hole is you that right yeah 
You gotta dig a then hole you guys fill it in before Beach Patrol comes back and yells at you. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. There's th there was that too, right? There was that. And also, I don't know if this isn't a thing anymore because, you know, digital cameras and digital technology has advanced so much in the last 25 years or so. But there were always these people roaming around with these bags and they were called telescope pictures. And they would always and they would offer to take you and your family's picture. Right. And then you would have to go down to one yeah. of their offices and pick up your picture. It's basically it was like a one hour photo or like a two day photo. Right. Place. Yeah. And you would get these things called telescope, uh, you know, pictures and you would and they would be the, in the form of a keychain. You can clip them to yeah. your keys and then you would have a lasting memory that would never fade. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still have any of yours in your possession? Like, do you have any? I don't think I have any in my possession. No, but I remember them. You, you got rid of them. OK, I think I still have a few laying around somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where they are. Anyone else know? Producers? Help me out here. But what you can help us out with is by liking and sharing this incredible memory lane filled <laughs> episode <laughs> of and I quote with urban fantasy writer, which is the main course here. Uh, Serby Gray is here with us. And if you have any questions for her, by all means, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. More than happy to take those as they come in. We were just diving into something known as our history in a state of land of Mary, also known as Maryland. For those of you keeping score at home, East Coast people just saying it happens so with that being said we've talked about uh the, now let's now for those of you watching or listening this is called ashes of regret now some people say no i have no regrets but then some people may say i do have regrets well what exactly is that so how is ashes of regret how did that come about and what's the elevator pitch okay so um ashes of regret i guess the elevator pitch was sometimes you have to be the villain to survive So this is a very different vibe. So this is the same world. And um, this character, her name is Tamaki. And she was a very um, kind of small character. She had a small role um, in Flames of a Falling God. And I had not intend, like, that was it. She was just supposed to come, do the thing, move the plot forward. And then she demanded her own book. So this is almost like a side quest in terms of, in the first book, um, our mother character is very sympathetic. She's trying to save her son. She's trying to navigate. Um, and Tamaki is like, I'm just going to survive. Like, I'm just going to do what I need to do. And so it's not a spoiler, I don't think, to say that um, she makes a very poor decision in the very first chapter, discovers blood magic, which is forbidden in my world because, um, well, uh, anyway, so it's forbidden. And she's like, okay, so what happens if I use it anyway? And hijinks ensue. Interesting. Dark, ma you know, magic that should not be used. So in the words of our friendly neighborhood, uh, Grail Knight, she chose poorly. <laughs> again and again. She chooses poorly again and again. But you know <laughs> what? I think that readers will understand why she's doing it. So I think that you know, they're going to understand that this is coming from a place of desperation and anger. Like, what would anyone do if ancient gods returned and started making up arbitrary rules? It's very true. But we do know that fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. There we go. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a pleasant train to be on if if, if you know what I mean. Uh, and again, and again, and again, and again. Boy, <clears throat> there's a song that could go on for days. <clears throat> Goodness gracious. And then we come to something that's a little bit more recent. Love and other... Now, I thought love was complicated. <laughs> but love mixed with other dangers. Yeah. Or to my friendly neighborhood, Darkwing Duck. With get dangerous. So love and other dangers. What's this all about? So this is really cool. Um, this is an anthology. So there are 16 authors, including me, and we are given the, the theme, um, combine love and dystopia. And so we all came at it in such different ways. We have, you know, stories that are set like um, in, in schools. We've got stories that are set in more uh, traditionally to dystopian um, we have mine, which is a segment um, where two of my characters from Flames of a Falling God 
are together on a side quest to um, to find the gates of hell because they have to deliver a message and um, what gets goes wrong. And the idea for my story is that each god is setting up their territory into its own form of dystopia. So if you've got the god of commerce on Leal, he's setting it up where the Walmart of head of you know Walmart used to be, right? So he's like taking over Arkansas, and um, we have a different god, Baal, who's doing military up in Pittsburgh. So each god is setting up their own dystopia based on what brings them energy. Um, so I just took my story and was like, let's go see what uh, Erishkigal, the goddess of the underworld, is doing. And unfortunately, it's bad things. Yeah, I mean, they don't call it love and other dangers for nothing. Bad things, Mikey. Bad things. <laughs> bad things. Bad. Very bad. So makes a lot of sense there. Sounds intriguing. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with anthologies. And then you get a little taste of everyone else's writing, which is great. Anthologies work great. Exactly. So like I said, my story like is based in my world and several other the authors did the same thing where it's like maybe an origin story or it's a side quest or it's just featuring the same characters. And so, yeah, you can try it out and say, oh, I do want to read more about this one or I want to read more about this one. Absolutely fair. Absolutely fair. Well, congratulations on that. That is amazing. So congrats on that and your other uh, books that we've discussed here so far in this episode of Van Dyke Quote. Now, do you have any other special memories from being at conventions or other events, whether you are there as a vendor or there as an attendee? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm kind of introverted. It's hard for me necessarily to like start conversations. Um, so for me, I actually like being behind the vendor table because it feels like I have a job. <laughs> So it's easier for me to focus on what I kind of have things like to show people. Um, and so it just, for me, I prefer to be behind a table because if I wasn't, then I'd be like, oh, maybe I'll just go back to my hotel room and just wait till I'm supposed to be on a panel again. Like I would find excuses to not engage. And then at the end of the weekend, I'd be like so surprised I hadn't had any encounters with people. So um, for me, my I, I usually prefer to be behind a table just because it feels like, okay, I'm on, I'm doing something, I can focus. So you're not there with all the other vendors at uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night at the bar, you know, having a brewski and saying, hey, how was your how was your day today at your table? Oh, it was good. I had this amount of sales. And then they say to you, well, you know, did you see any of the celebs downstairs and how crazy they were getting on the dance floor? I said, yeah, I remember seeing Shaq and that other dude you know well i mean if someone like kind of grabbed me and said okay we're going to the bar and we're going to sit there and you are going to have a seat then i would go like I, i'm not i'm not unamenable to going i think that i have a couple times when i did go but it was like that it was kind of like there was a group and they're like okay crb we're going here and you're coming too and i was like oh okay okay we're doing that okay that's fair. That's really fair. What would you enjoy more, uh, dancing into the night or singing your heart out? And oh, gosh. Out? I will dance over sing any day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't have a – don't feel comfortable enough to sing a song for the kind folks out there? <laughs> no way. I will spare them. You will spare them. Okay. <laughs> but well, let me ask you this, though. If, if you got a group of your friends and they asked you, hey, we're going to sing it as a group. We're going to be like the Spice Girls or something. Like what what song would you be willing to sing with a group of people? Would you be willing to sing with a group of people or you just don't want to do it, period? Um, I mean, maybe with a group of people, but I'd be like, oh, I don't want to bring the group down because I can't sing. Like I'm, I don't want to be the one who's like getting us disqualified here or kicked off the stage. Well, you can always pull a Jimmy Fallon and just limp sync it. <laughs> you know, you can always pull that. I mean, people do it all the time on the on the Late Show, you know, on the Tonight Show. So okay. You can always do it that way if you want. All right, but I mean, if if a group of friends really wanted me up there with them, I would stand with them. Oh, okay. Why not? You only live once. But yes, yes. You gotta make every memory count. Yeah, celebrate it. Do what you can. <laughs> That's, you know, it's one of the beauties of being at conventions. You get to meet people you otherwise wouldn't meet in a normal everyday situation. You get to geek out about your favorite things in life, whether it's urban fantasy, which is not particularly my cup of tea, but, it, but there are fans out there. It has its fans for sure. Like that, that's a huge, like that genre covers a lot of ground. So yeah, 
urban fantasy. You can talk to people who like Star Trek, which Lord knows we know plenty of those people. Uh, you know, or <laughs> just people who like reading books in general. Right. You know, because reading books is is fun, right? Because all you gotta fun. do, all you gotta do is take a look. It's in a book. See what I did there? You're welcome. <laughs> You're absolutely welcome. <laughs> all you gotta do, Serby Gray. All we gotta do is take a look in the book. That's all you gotta do. And Lord knows, and for those of you who may be listening to this episode of And I Quote with Urban Fantasy Writer Serby Gray, she has a monumental sized library behind her that she has access to 24 7. So literally, that's what I just said, literally. So you go behind if you go to behind the scenes here at her studio, respectively, she has a book for every genre that will cover every, all your bases for the most part. And if you need something, she will find it or she will find someone who knows how to find it because True. she's got hundreds. Of, I mean, do you have a number here of how many books are in your collection, respectively? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, not only do I have my library, but then, you know, I've got my to be read pile by my bed. Oh. And then we have the extra books in the basement. And then each of my children um, has a bookshelf in their room. Oh, so the love of books has indeed been passed on to the next generation. I've certainly tried. And I know it gets it gets harder. Like once you hit high school, you don't have any time in your life. Mm -mm. And that's when reading kind of drops off. And so... Um, for me, I've really tried to be like with my older kids, you know, I will give them books for Christmas and, you know, like something that's like addictive that they have to read or like a summer book for when they're on the beach or something like that, just to keep it going. Um, it exercises your imagination. It allows you to be empathetic. It keeps your vocabulary strong. And for goodness sakes, they're just fun, like you said. Hmm. Very true. Very true. And once again, we are here with the incredible urban fantasy writer and librarian extraordinaire times five, <laughs> Serby Gray, uh, here on And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this with everyone you know, with everyone that you know. And if you have any questions for her, by all means, let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat. And for those of you who have been watching live or on the replay, thank you for doing so. We cannot do this without you. We greatly appreciate your support as we go through this journey of what is known as life together. If life can be a board game, right? And life can be a serial. Does anyone remember Life Serial? Yeah, that was a thing. And a few other things. Then, hey, you're doing something right. I'm just <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Now, would you be up for your book series or stories that you've written in your past be, be willing to have them adapted as a miniseries or a movie? Oh, my gosh. I would love that. Would I be up for it? I, I really, because I set... Um, the first one in Baltimore and the second one in Pittsburgh. Um, like the, just the settings I think would really lend themselves to a mini series or a movie. I would love to see that, that not only would I be up for it, like I would jump, I would jump for joy right now. I would jump on my chair like Tom Cruise did on Oprah. <laughs> I rem I understood that reference. And yes, <laughs> I remember watching that on YouTube long after it already aired because, you know, it aired during a time where I was, I was watching certain areas of television, but t daytime talk shows was not one of them because those are a different <laughs> audience. Just saying to each their own. Leave it there. That's enough. But that's awesome. So if you're going to have this adapted, hypothetically, if this series was adapted into a miniseries or movie, would you want it to be animated or live action? Oh, Wow. Okay. That's an awesome question. Mm -hmm. I had pictured it live action, but now that you've said that, I would not be opposed. Like I would just love so much for this to be made into that other media, you know, medium that I would take whatever. With that, do you have any names of any actors or actresses you would want to cast in certain roles or would you just leave that to the professionals known as casting directors? What would you do? I mean, maybe my choices are a little too, you know, whatever. But if, if I was doing it, I pictured Rachel, who is the mom, like as a Julianne Moore type character. Um, who would I think for Tamaki? Um, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I just need someone who can, can do angry and haughty really well. Um, my park ranger, Scott, um, 
I don't know. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Now, I'm, now you're getting me excited. Now I'm starting to like spin through like, oh, who would I do there? Um, yeah, uh, I guess for Captain Lewis, maybe it's overdone, but something like Brad Pitt. Again, I know overdone, but I think that he does commit to roles. And when he says he's going to do something, he does it. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's done a lot of different things over the course of his historic career. And I admire that. I admire artists who try to do different things. Like they're not just going to allow themselves to be pigeonholed, but like they're going to keep trying to grow. He stepped outside the box a yeah. couple times. I mean, he also asked us the question, what's in the box? But, you know. Do you remember that movie that he did with that line in it? Do you remember that one? What is that from? It's called Seven. It's called Seven. Oh, 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 gosh. Oh, yes, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. Starred him. I did not put that together. It's okay. It was him, Morgan Freeman, and Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes. Were, were in the movie, right? They were, that was the cast. And I believe, if I remember this correctly, it was directed by David Fincher, I want to say. David Fincher? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But now I completely have recalled that scene. So thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't mean to creep you out there. <laughs> it is a creepy, it's a very disturbing, like you don't see what's in the box, but you find out what's in there. They just don't show it to you because they want you to use your imagination. But you're thinking to yourself, oh. dude, that's gross, man. Did they, so they didn't show us? Because I can picture it very clearly. They reveal verbally what is okay. in the box, but they don't okay. specifically show you a camera angle focused on the gotcha. actual object that's in the box. Well, it obviously worked because like in my head ball, I, I have that imagination right so if you go back and watch the scene which you can find clips of it respectively on the interwebs feel free to rewatch it and see if you can figure out what exactly was in that box because it's it's pretty uh, grotesque but at the same time it's great acting yeah so you can give credit where credit is due from brad pitt and of course i mean morgan freeman's been doing it for what 150 years oh my gosh so he, he doesn't seem to age either no i think he's played a 60 year old in like 80% of his movies. So like, <laughs> and I don't mean that it's an insult. I don't mean it as an insult because he 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 knows how to play a character. Yeah. He just does. Yeah. And full disclosure, when you sit down to watch what is eventually what is what is known as the Nutcracker in the Four Realms, Morgan Freeman's in it. Really? So, yes, he's in it. Okay. He's in the movie. He, he plays a supporting character, a supporting character, but feel free to you'll understand what I mean when you sit down and watch the movie. It may, yeah. It'll make a lot more sense later, but cuz I don't want to get into spoilers respectively. <laughs> I try not to do that on this show. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But okay, well, if your series comes into fruition as an animated or a live action type series of movies or whatever the case may be, hey, we hope the odds are ever in your favor. Okay, I recognize that. I recognize that, okay? <laughs> okay, see, so, yeah, you got all those books behind you, so I'm assuming you've got to <laughs> recognize something that's a bit more modern day, but, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. And by the way, our good friend Julie uh, Alpern is here. She says, surprise, Ryan. Surprise, Julie. It's good to see you, my good friend. Hope everything's well in your neck of the woods. Now, if you have any questions for our guest of honor, and I do mean guest of honor. She's a book dragon, by the way, uh, in real life. Okay? This is IRL, in real life. For those of you keeping up with the acronyms at home, feel free to ask her a question or a comment or so in the comment section below or the, or the live chat. And don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. Good to see you, uh, Jules. Love you. <laughs> That being said, I do want to let you know that this episode of And I Quote and every episode of And I Quote is indeed powered by our good friends over here at Poddex. Now, Poddex, get this. Poddex are the hottest, and it do mean red hot like dragon's breath. <laughs> New, see, I'm using all the dragonisms today. New tool for podcasts is looking to have more meaningful conversations or simply gamify their podcast. So you simply shuffle up the cards, you ask a question, and you let the content roll. You can get yours today at poddex.com make sure you use that promo code there ryan 10 that's r-y-a-n-1-0 for 10 percent off your order powered by my poddex so poddex wants to know serby gray what do you keep on your desk or what is known as your workspace area that boosts your mood um well so at work i also have books <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> I know. Um, but you know what? I will say my um, one of my daughters crochets. And like she's amazing. And so she actually, um, for my books, she has crocheted a two-headed moose. And she has crocheted a fox for the second book. Um, and then at work, I have a peacock that's like this high. And um, I keep that there. It's really it's the beautiful colors and the tail. 
and um, my dog was chewing up one of those chew toys, right? It squeaks and like he chews it rah, and then it rips open and all the stuffing pops out and the squeaker, you have to go and grab the squeaker so they don't eat it. Okay, so she grabbed the squeaker and I'm thinking, that's awesome. What a thoughtful child, right? Well, she shoves it into the peacock, sews it up. And now my peacock goes squeak, squeak, squeak whenever um, I get annoyed. Right. Yeah. So whenever I just need a little like laugh, if like, if, I don't know, whatever's going on at work, I just reach over. I'm like, squeak, squeak. It's just my little thing. I like it. It makes me happy. Oh, my goodness. Anybody remember the squeaky toys we all had as children? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, granted, this one is taking a bit of a different liberty with it because it's creative liberties being shown. But still, that's amazing that uh, your child crochets. That's amazing. It's amazing. How long have they been doing that? So um, hold on. Can I can I grab the two? Yes. I'll show it to you. Yes, you can. If you if you wish, if it's if it's uh, what do you call it nearby in your studio somewhere? I don't know where. To... <laughs> and by the way, the, they live in the library. So it's yes. OK, so look, what do we have here? This is the um. This is the two-headed moose Aww. that she crocheted. Look at um, that. This is the bad head from the book. Once you ah. read it, you'll know what that means. So yeah. that's the two-headed moose. And then this is the um, the fox that she crocheted from my second book. That is so cute. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, thank, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. That is, oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> that's amazing. That takes a lot of patience and a lot of skill. She's, yeah, she's really good. She started um, during COVID, during the, you know, the lockdown. kind of lockdown. Mm -hmm. Wow. I became an even bigger fan of books during the lockdown. So you're welcome, Serby Gray. <laughs> I did. I, I did. Because honestly, you said it yourself. It's very difficult for kids to get into books when they got into high school. When I got into mm -hmm. middle school and high school, I just didn't care anymore. I could care less because right. you had to do it. You had to do it. You yeah. just forcing these books down your throat. But yes. when you graduate and you move on to greener pastures, whether it's getting a job, making that mad money, or you're going to college pursuing a degree, which by the way, if you decide to go to college, there's nothing wrong with that either. Because pursuing a degree isn't isn't a bad thing. And plus it adds a little oomph to your resume. That's not a bad thing either. But the best thing that happened to me during the lockdown was that I became a bookworm. And I love it now. I absolutely love it. I've met so many independent writers and authors because of it. And, I, and some of them are my closest friends now, including, you know, Serby Gray just happens to be one of our good friends here at And I Quote. So it, it's a beautiful thing when you can connect with people. You know? Yes, absolutely. It, yeah. It's, you know, in the words of our friendly neighborhood movie, it's all so magical, you know, and I love that movie so much. And by the way, Julia Alpern says that's so true about Morgan Freeman playing any role that he steps into. Yes, it's true. And then Julie Alperin's giving you uh, yes emojis, like high fives right there. She's also giving you party favors or party, uh, you know, emojis right there. Serving. <laughs> I think Julie likes you. I don't know. Uh, maybe she's just having a good time watching this episode. Who knows, Julie Alperin? That's up to you. But <laughs> all good. Poddex wants to know, what are most people afraid of that doesn't scare you? Um. Okay, so... I am certainly scared of many things, but height does not bother me. And so um, this summer, my family and I, we went over to um, to Switzerland and they have, and so we were like hiking and they have these tiny little bridges attached to these cliffs. And like, it just, it didn't bother me at all. I don't know why, and I'm scared of many things, but like that particularly, and they had like a section where you could actually like, you know, make a jump and vibrate. And then they had like a part that was even more thin. I, it didn't bother me. I'm up there. I'm taking pictures. I'm like, oh, this is so great. You can see everything. You can feel the wind. And I look back and my, my family's like way back over there. They're like, we're good. We'll wait for you here. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Well, evidently fear is not a factor for you when it comes to that, because when it comes to heights, I'm not the biggest fan of that. No pun intended. <laughs> I'm just not. That's what I'm saying. It makes no sense. I'm scared of a ton of things, but for some reason, that just doesn't bother me. Okay. Well, that makes one of us. Congratulations. Fear is not a factor for you. In the words of a certain reality show that lasted way too long for its own good. But Podex wants to know, what's the most creative excuse to get out of doing something you didn't want to do oh the most creative to get out of something i didn't want to do hmm 
I'm sure I have like, I don't know that I can recall something like right off the bat. Um, in fact, I feel like as an adult, I've tried to get better at just saying, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Instead of trying to do those kind of elaborate ruses. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I'm actually trying to move in the other direction and just saying, no, no, I don't want to do that. All right. Well, nothing wrong with saying the magic words, either yes or no, depending on the situation. So it's completely fair. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you put up what is known as a boundary in any area of your life to keep people out? Um, that's hard. Like, so I'm a people pleaser. I want people to be happy. Um, when other people are happy, then it makes me happy, um, which is super not healthy um, to, to take your own happiness and place it in the hands of others. Um, so I realize that. And yet when other people are happy, I'm happy. So it's, it's, it's a balance. Um, especially it's, it's too easy for me to take things personally that sometimes it's just business. And so, um, like that movie, The Godfather, you know, that's actually really good for me in a way to just watch like, because with them, it's all business. It's not personal at all. Well, I, I can make arguments that some of it was personal, but they try to frame it. They try to pretend it's all business or it's all, this is just the way things are done. Yeah. Some scenes in that movie. It's so unnecessary. You know, <laughs> we ever going to take the cannoli. Uh, you know, it's just. <laughs> you know, and then they always drop that line in the middle of the movie. It's nothing personal. Right. Yeah. It's just business. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. Like these two families have been at it for a number of years. So don't you think they would take it personally at this point? I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You know, the strange thing is I've never seen Godfather two or three. Really? That is strange to me. Is it? Yeah. I've never seen Godfather two or three. I've only seen the original. I've only seen the first one. Yeah. I, that that when you watch them, you're gonna have to drop me a line and let me know because I now should. it's just gonna be this open question of what when is, is Ryan gonna watch those? Yeah, it's it's completely fair. And speaking of you know what is it, mobster mafia movies? I've never even seen Goodfellas with Ray Liotta. <laughs> I've never even seen that either. I know, okay. I know. It's it's people look at me like I'm crazy, and I'm thinking, listen. You guys may have grown up on certain movies, but there are just a lot of movies that I missed out on as a youngin. Or when I got a bit older, I missed out on a lot of things that were big hits in the later 90s or the 2000s yeah. and early 2010s that I just never got around to. Like earlier this year, a perfect example, I just got around to finally seeing Nutcracker in the Four Realms for the first time. I finally got around to seeing the animated film Tarzan for the very first time. I got around to seeing movies like Wreck-It Ralph for the first time and Moana. Um, well, what about, um, what about the, the Sopranos? My, my late father, my brothers watched it when it was originally, you know, on television, yeah. respectively, but I never got around to seeing it. So I can't comment or speculate. All I know is that it ends with Tony looking outside and seeing a cat roaming around and then it goes to black. Yeah. That's the only thing I, I know of Soprano, but I've never seen it overall. So I should probably sit down and watch a couple episodes. Is that what you're telling me? I liked the Sopranos. Um, That's fair. And I liked the idea, the premise, which is you have this this mobster, this mob boss, I guess maybe. And he's shown to be like incredibly violent, you know, he's business. Blah, blah, blah. And then he has to go visit his mom. Who's like bossing him around because he's like, you know, got it. So he's, that was interesting to me because it was like a switch. It was like a reversal. It's not what I expected. Oh, okay. Okay. I, okay. I'm like, I'm a big fan of like things that uh, like that cross genres. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to me. Is there another film or TV series that crosses genres for you that you enjoy? Hmm. Aside I from mean, Sopranos and stuff like that? I don't know that this crosses genres. Ba Battlestar Galactica, mm. I really enjoyed because it was science fiction. Mm. But there was so much to it, right? A lot about um, humanity. Yeah. The the Foundation series that kind of you know I guess it's science fiction but parts of it were also magic that was the, that was science fantasy. Yeah, 
Yeah, I could see that. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to, has the second movie of Dune come out? I don't, mm, well, it is December. It should be coming out soon. Yeah, it hasn't okay. come out yet, I don't think. Someone's going to have to Google that for us in the backstage area of their studios, respectively. But it's coming out soon, yes. I enjoyed the first movie. Um, bought the book because like, I'm like, I don't even know if I've ever read either. I've read parts of it. I don't know. Or I couldn't remember. Right. Um, but it's sitting by my bed. It's TBR. <laughs> you should see my TBR. It's like six miles deep. <laughs> It's, it's incredible. You know, you know what the funny thing is, is that I finally started going back and reading what are known as Star Wars novels. And we all know that Star Wars novels is a very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> there's a difference between what is canon, right? what is not canon. But for mm -hmm. me, I don't care if it's Legends, which is the non-canon stuff, or the new stuff like High Republic. Okay. I, I don't care if it's canon or not. I treat every story as its own story. And if I enjoy it, I enjoy it. Does it affect my enjoyment of the movies or TV series? No. Because those are separate mediums. Okay. They're very different mediums. So if mm -hmm. I'm reading a stand, Star Wars standalone novel that happens to be set in what is known as the new canon, I'll enjoy it. And if I think of something that may relate to a TV series that something may be mentioned, you know, there might be a little, like a little loose thread that's mentioned on a TV series. I'm like, oh, I remember from reading that book. That's cool. They connected it a little bit. And that's interesting to me. But at the same time, I enjoy the books for the books. I don't look for what needs to be connected to Star Wars and what doesn't okay. need to be connected to. I don't care. Okay. I don't care. I just enjoy the ride. That's interesting. I enjoy the ride. That's just, I can't speak for everybody because there are Star right. Wars fans who take things very, very seriously. But I just enjoy the ride, my friends. And if you <laughs> want to know what I've read recently, visit us on Goodreads. Because Goodreads is a good way to keep track of all the books you've read and the things you want to okay. read. So... Yes. Which I'm sure our good friend Serby Gray, the book dragon, <laughs> uh, can attest to. Are you familiar with Goodreads at all? Yes, I ha yeah, I have an account. Um, my books are up there. Um, every once in a while, I check to see if I have any reviews. Which, are, as an author, you're not supposed to do. You're just supposed to leave it alone. But occasionally, really? I check to see what people say. Mm, that's oh. fair. That's fair. Do your children have Goodreads accounts? Or they're too young. And so they go. I'm trying to remember. They they're like Goodreads. That's for old people. I'm like, oh, uh, okay, all right. And so there's something else that they go to, but I can't remember the name of it. Uh, oh gosh, what's the other one? It's it's oh man, it's not Goodreads. It's it's not Amazon reviews. It's not Audible. It's not Kindle. It's not oh gosh. Um, is, is it Threads? It's not Threads. No, that's an Instagram thing. I can't remember. I can't. Yeah, it's it's something. I was so offended. I was just done with that conversation. <laughs> no, it's fair. It's fair. But man, how dare they say that Goodreads is for old people? Look at me. Do I look old to you? Does <laughs> she look at No. Serbia and I do. None of us here look old. None of us here look old. We're all young at heart. That is the point. That is the point. We are young at heart. It doesn't matter what the age is. Age, you know, some people have said on the interwebs, I don't know if you agree with this or not. Age is just a number. You're only as old as you feel. You know what okay. I mean? I mean, it could, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, that's just what I've heard. Have you heard any of these phrases? But I mean, I think there is something to it in terms of being young is is also about remaining adaptable, saying, okay, how is this generation going to do things? What's what's current in the news? Not staying like so rigid in your own, well, this is the way things were done. I think that's more of the attitude that, okay, age is just a number as long as you're willing to remain flexible and when willing to be open to like the way things are going. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. See, this is why we bring on book dragons <laughs> on these shows to enhance our knowledge and our creativity. So <laughs> well done to <laughs> be great so far, but Poddex is very curious about something. They, they want to know, would you rather, this is a okay. would you rather type situation. Okay. Would you rather have what is known as a cool boss and learn absolutely nothing or a strict boss who you learn from? Oh, okay. I think, I mean, the right answer is, oh, I would rather have a strict boss so I can learn and be self-sufficient, right? But at this point in my life, I kind of know what I'm doing. So in that case, I would rather now have a cool boss who just leaves me alone. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, a cool boss who just leave me alone. <laughs> Let me do my own thing. I mean, right? Like maybe bring me a coffee and then just go into your office and just leave me alone. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Which you prefer, coffee or tea every morning? Um, I used to like enjoy tea. Mm -hmm. And then I just um one day I just gave up and was like, fine, just give me the coffee. Just give it to me. That's fine. And now uh, every morning I have my um, my latte with almond milk and an espresso shot. Sometimes I mix it up on the weekends and have a pumpkin spice. Yes, I'm that person. I do. I enjoy my pumpkin spice latte. Do you? Okay. I'm I sorry if that means I have been lowered in your estimation. No. I enjoy that spicy goodness. Spicy goodness. Fast girl. Anyway, the fox. What does the fox say? <laughs> we need spicy lattes on aisle three. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you prefer the drink to be served to you in what is known as a tumbler, a thermos, or a cup? Or do you take it intravenously through an IV like some people do in the internet? Like some people have had this meme that says, I need coffee. And they have yeah. an IV. Mm, no, I'm not going to blow my veins for coffee. Mm -mm. No, no, I want um, my own tumbler so that I'm not, you know, contributing to, you know, landfill somewhere. That's and it's just the right size because when I finish, I always want a little more. Like, that's just my personality. I'm like, oh, coffee made me feel good. So I want more. So I, I have to control myself by just having my proper size. Because I'd rather be, you know, want a little more than like get obnoxious. You're welcome, Rural. That's completely for my fair. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe you can get a misbegotten series uh, themed tumbler. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. It's called merchandising, merchandising, <laughs> where the real money from the mo movies are made. You know, if you want to do merchandising, there's always an opportunity for indie authors to do so. You know, might be something to. New Year's resolution, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we can get some misbegotten uh, swag for everybody at home to purchase. Maybe I can like take this this moose and like have it like put on a t-shirt or something. Yeah, you can get t-shirts made, right? Yeah. There are ways for you to do that, by the way. There are ways <laughs> for that to be done. Creativity abounds, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you to the book dragon in real life herself, urban fantasy writer. <laughs> Serby Gray for being our guest on this episode of Anti Quote. Serby Gray, it has been a pleasure having you Oh my you gosh, here it was so fun. And talking with you and learning uh, so much from you and to learn the fact that you are not a bookworm, you are much rather a book dragon than anything else. And you have your own library in the comfort of your very own home. So congratulations, you've beaten Belle and everyone else who have competed <laughs> for the title of Miss Belle from Beauty and the Beast in Real Life.com, which is not a real website. I'm just making this up as you go. <laughs> uh, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, on all your success, everything that you've done, everything that you will do. And if a person is watching or listening to this, wants to know more about you or perhaps purchase a copy of your books, where is the best place to find you? Great. Yeah. So um, my website is crbgraybooks.com. I'm on Instagram, crbgray. Um, I just started a TikTok account. So kind of finding my rhythm with that. Um, and my books are sold. Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Robo, Apple, like everywhere the books are sold, mine are available. Fantastic. Excellent, Smithers. Uh, congratulations. Hey. I recognize I, that. You do. You do recognize that. Okay. <laughs> I was just making sure I was able, you were able to keep up. There are a lot of pop culture references out there sometimes. Sometimes people catch them. Sometimes they don't. And that's okay because everyone's knowledge is different. But you know what they say, right? Knowledge is power. Use yeah. it to the best of your ability. So for those of you wondering what, what on earth is this guy doing? Well, I just happen to be the host of this show known as Anti Quote. If you want to follow me in the craziness that ensues and maybe the other conversations that Serby Gray are going to have uh, in the future. And by the way, she's always welcome to come back here on Anti Quote and talk more about the greatness that is books and reading and <laughs> writing, which is which is important as well, just as important as anything else. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RyanRPM5. Also, also, make sure you're following us on all forms of social media at and I quote channel. We got a lot of great things coming your way very soon, including our 1,000 subscriber celebration. We are this close to hitting 1,000 subscribers. And once we do, we're going to throw a great big live stream celebration. It's going to include returning favorites, such as the book dragon herself. Serby Gray is going to be joining us, I'm sure. She'll have more things to share about books and dragons and fantasy and all that. <laughs> And all that awesome stuff. And who knows? Maybe she can. Maybe we can get more crochet mooses on the show. <laughs> and we're going to have surprise.
surprise guests that you may uh, otherwise expect to be here on set. And also we're going to have giveaways presented by our good friend, the art of John Pinto. These are 11 by 17 prints that we're going to be sending over to you once we reach a thousand subscribers and do some special giveaways on our social medias, including a print featuring this character known as the Dark Lord of the Sith, also known as Darth Vader. Look at that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You want to talk about science fiction and fantasy? Look at this. Star Trek Strange New Worlds with Anson Mount and company on that bad boy. Look at this. This could be yours. You can you we could be sending this over to you and you can put it up in your home or your office space, which, by the way, wait until everyone leaves before you start beating up the copy machine. And if you're a fan of this character who just celebrated his 60th birthday recently, I don't know if Serby Gray is familiar with this, but Doctor Who just turned the big big six O with returning favorites to, for the Doctor Who specials. So those and many, many more. We got so many other prints featuring many, many different fandoms that we could be sending directly to you, but only if we reach a thousand subscribers before the end of the year of 2023. Also, you want to support this wonderful thing called a show and I quote channel. You can buy us a coffee or in our case, buy us a pizza. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash and I quote channel. The link is in the bio. Link is in the description below. You can support the show in any way, shape, or form that you can. And we would appreciate it greatly. Who knows? Maybe we can get more book dragons like Serby Gray on here. That's all you got to do. Support the show. It's that simple. Also, if you're looking for crazy things known as merch, guess what? We got all kinds of merch that are up in our Redbubble store right now. We got hoodies. We got t-shirts. We got we got Tumblr or not Tumblr. We got mug, coffee mugs. Speaking of coffee or lattes, Serby Gray, we got coffee mugs and we got stickers. Yeah, stickers. You can put them on your Tumblr or your car or your notebooks or your dragon books. I don't know. But – we got tons and tons of great merch that's on sale right now. The link is in the description below. Check it out. Also, if you're a fan of The War and the Stars, Nerdy Cantina is going to be on Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time. All kinds of stuff is coming your way. We are so excited. This year has been great in so many ways. This channel has grown in more ways than one, and I want to thank everyone who has contributed to our success, including Serby Gray. She, you, You're a great person. You're doing so many wonderful things with your writing and your creativity, as well as being a, you know, real life book dragon so it, it's it you know hey what's good for the goose is good for the gander so that's what they say on the interweb i mean i don't think they say it anymore that's going back 150 years but hey i can bring back old, old school catchphrases it's no big deal that's what we do but once again like comment share subscribe ring that bell to be notified when our videos go up or they go live and remember life is better when reading take a look Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFF Comics. Author Cindy Kep is writing on the edge. Books include Remnant in the Stars, The Loudest Actions, Lines of Succession, Mindstorm, Condemned Courier, The Yerushalon Series. Animal Eye. Find author Cindy Kep at C K O E P P dot com today. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>